There is a curious epigraph in philosopher Rosie Bridotti's 1994 monograph, Nomadic Subjects, and I quote, there are no mad women in this attic, end of quote. And it was written on a chalkboard in the Women's Studies Department by Berta Kowaldeck at Utrecht in the 1990s, and then a department confined to just a very hard to reach attic. And I think this line speaks to a number of interrelated problems whose impact the study of 19th century literature continuously debates. It was articulated in a women's studies department 30 years ago, so it raises the ongoing question of Victorian studies disciplinarity and its current limitations. And as such, it also speaks to the madness of diverging from the institutions in the humanities for fear of being banished to well, the literal attic here. And it also denotes an epistemological academic position that questions any assumption of inherently female madness. And today, however, it cannot be read without also confronting the idolization of what Olivia Luxing Moy has termed, quote, Gilbert and Gubar's hallowed attic, the meta space of Victorianist women's studies, end of quote, and the historically exclusionary functions of white feminism in the field. And central to my paper and connected to these points, this line also brings the colonial entanglement of 19th century literature into dialogue with Bradotti's notion of feminist nomadic subjectivities. At this point, then, a brief overview of the concept seems up before I use it to decenter the imagination of no mad women in two sensation novels. Harriet Gordon Smythe's 1865 A Faithful Woman and Ellen Wood's 1870 Bessie Rain. So, Bradotti's figurative, evocative, and anti-essential understanding of nomadism as a feminist category relies on the appreciation of, quote, the dynamic nature of thinking and the need to reinstate movement at the heart of thought by actualizing a non-unitary vision of the thinking subject, end of quote. So for Bradotti, movement here functions as a metaphor for a feminism that constantly elides the rigid structures of always essential being, but also of institutionalized traditions of thought that monumentalize and thus fix core tenets that all too often undergird white male positionalities and, and privileges. Um, as such, the, the epigraph is a refusal to understand female anti-normativity in the same terms and from within the dominant patriarchal systems in which their usage originates, like madness, here. At the same time, as the nomad, no mad dichotomy within this, this word um, indicates, it is the material condition and experience of movement, of displacement, unbelonging, and or migration that has historically decentered epistemic and academic hegemonies. With regard to the Jane Eyre reference, we need look no further than Jean Rees and Gayatri Spiva for such mobile nomadic interventions that Bradotti has in mind. Both have directed particular attention to the unnarrated racialized subject and the modalities of speaking in and through those canonical texts that marginalize these. Um, and it is in such an interplay of very broadly speaking structure and agency that for Bradotti subjectivity emerges and forms itself. And to her it is a quote, a socially mediated process of entitlements to and negotiations with power relations, end of quote. So taking all of this on board, nomadic subjectivity emerges as a relational, constantly shifting navigation alongside, through, but also against dominant discursive structures, always grounded in a feminist appreciation of intellectual and physical, often transnational mobility. And with these brief thoughts in mind, I want to turn to a faithful woman and Bessie Rain. If, for Bradotti, intellectual nomadism means quote, cultivating the art of disloyalty, end of quote, to the epistemic systems in which we move. I'd like to propose in the following 10 minutes a notion of possible disloyalty to the two novels at hand, hoping to contribute to reparative readings of them. And that's also why I'm so excited about Jesse Erickson's reading group uh, at this conference. In light of the white authorial positionalities and their entanglement in British imperial myth-making with regards to Woodham thinking of 
and Jetkovic's critique of her white maternalism. Um, I think we should be skeptical of these novels' own assessments of their sensational villainesses. Channeling Homi Baba here somewhat, imperial texts carry their own deconstructive potential, particularly when they essentialize and sensationalize evil as feminine, as exotic, as infectious and disruptive. And I count a faithful woman and Bessie Rain among this category. Reading these novels through the lens of nomadic subjectivity means, for me, to excavate the transnational agency conceded to their nomad women by the hostile textual terrain that imagines them. A Faithful Woman is arguably a very generic sensation novel about a murdered infant who is the heir to a castle, a virtuous consumption-defying heroine, false executions, a gruesome monomaniac, an escaping enslaved woman, and a slew of happy weddings at the end. What makes it so susceptible to an engagement with transnational nomadic othered femininity is its central villain, Lady Armine. She is the daughter of an Indian princess, and throughout the novel, Lady Armine seems a thoroughly despicable, clearly racialized stock villain, marked by her quote-unquote black blood and the quote ghastly pallor of her Hindu features, end of quote. So what about this sensational and conventionally racialized exoticism is so disruptive? To answer this, I want to turn to the novel's opening chapters. Lady Armine's character is first introduced when the police, during a raid, open up a sealed room. Here you see the entire scene on the left-hand side. Years ago, when Lady Armine's sister, the Lady Olivia, alluded to in this excerpt, eloped with a commoner, Lady Armine vandalized her room in revenge. And it has remained shut up to the events of the novel. I want to focus on two aspects here. First, the origin of this scene in colonial historiography, and second, its politics of racialization. As for its origins, most representations of Indian villainy in the 1860s cannot but relate to the Indian rebellion. But a faithful woman seems to go one step further by copying this scene of devastation from James Candy's The Great Indian Mutiny of 1857. A faithful woman clearly borrows the entire idea for the scene from Kennedy. And I've color coded the slides to show you how the novel creatively expands upon almost every single point that Kennedy makes. So if you'd like to compare these two texts, probably press pause as I will be switching back to the original view later. At first glance, a faithful woman borrows and adapts a passage in which Kennedy seeks to illustrate the alleged barbarism of the rebels with a particular focus on their disdain for what he understands as civilization. Read as such, Lady Armine's lack of self-control, or her frenzy, as Kennedy would call it, speaks of her inherently vile, true Indianness. However, the context of her anger severely complicates such a reading, for Lady Armine acts not in defiance of an essentially constructed imperial Britishness, but in defense of it. When she murders her sister's lapdog and vandalizes her room, she punishes her sister for her elopement and thus for a violation of societal British aristocratic norms and a violation of their, the sisters belonging to them. And before I go on, I'd like to point out that my focus on such ideological complications of Victorian popular imaginations of Indianness follows and builds upon a large body of work, particularly early post-colonial criticisms such as Benita Perry's 1972 Delusions and Discoveries, and of course, Gayatri Spivak's criticism and um, interventions since the 1980s, and more recent work like Pablo Mukherjee's, so thanks for inviting him to the conference, um, or the organizers. In Crime and Empire, Mukherjee, for example, reads Philip Meadows, Taylor's and others' fictionalizations of the rebellion as possibly legitimizing it, arguing that in such works, quote, the suspicion that criminality may actually be a legitimate critique of British oppression could never quite be removed, end of quote. And to come back to the text at hand, such lingering suspicions also characterize my reading of A Faithful Woman and its sensational disruption of imperial orders. And central here is Lady Armine's revenge. 
particularly the fact that she drenches her sister's portrait in ink and covers the statuette of her in ash. By literally darkening the images of her disloyal sister, she seeks to make visible Lady Olivia's allegedly real pre-existing racialized otherness that comes to the fore in her elopement to Lady Armine, of course, only. In the eyes of the self-professedly anglicized Lady Armine, transgressing a narrowly delineated aristocratic code of conduct is punishable by renativization. In this act of withdrawing her sister's claim to white Britishness, we can see the epistemological privilege that the novel affords Lady Armine when it comes to the processes of racialization. She understands that within colonial hierarchies, granting and revoking degrees of whiteness is a biopolitical strategy to solidify one's own position. I see this scene as an apt metonymy for colonial constructions of superiority that rely on civilizational discourses like Kennedy's to write into existence the racialized alterity of Indianness, and on which Lady Armine, the allegedly quote unquote criminal Indian, to use Mukherjee's phrase, now herself relies, as indicated by the fact that her writings on the wall, ingratitude, treachery, revenge, even borrow the emphasis from Kennedy if we compare the two original scans here. As such, Lady Armine's subversive mimicry relies on the same markers as the colonial arbitration of racialized belonging and unbelonging. Ink, but also ash. And while I cannot discuss it in detail here, like burnt cork, ash here signals her adaption of minstrelsy's imagination and denigration of blackness. But so, to sum up, Lady Armine's nomadic subjectivity allows her to navigate, to appropriate, and to literally inscribe herself into Britain's white, punitive, post-mutiny discourse. And all that in the very scene that supposedly marks her frenzied otherness. I want to come to my second example now, Ellen Wood's 1870 Bessie Rain. Without going into the details of the plot and its complex intertwined family relations, the novel's events coalesce around its central villainess, Mrs. North, commonly called Madam. She's the widow of a major in India and uh, she's introduced as, quote, a severely handsome woman with a cold, pale, imperious face, the glittering jewels in her black hair looking as hard as she did, a cruel face, as some might have deemed it, end of quote. As it transpires in the third volume's grand reveal, while married in India, she was unfaithful and even worse, gambled away the family's modest income and forged her husband's signature to accumulate debt and ruin him, and in shame he shot himself, and the entire affair was hushed over. And it's striking here that her visual identification with her jewellery marks her as one of Britain's imperial exploits, and given the novel's genre, her symbolic identification with a gemstone from India, cursed because of its exoticism, must of course resonate most obviously with Collins' The Moonstone. And indeed, Madam as we know her is made or completed in British India. Her aristocratic persona is condensed into its current form in Madras. She goes there, a young woman from a family of hoteliers, but when she returns to Britain as a widow, um, quote, from her airs and graces, she put on Mr. North might have concluded they, her family, were dukes and duchesses at least, end of quote. Madame's nomadic mobility, crisscrossing the globe, forging a new identity in India, and a frequent sojourns to London and Paris in the novel, informs her entire being, and it imbues her with the potential to cause catastrophe that, as I argue, speaks to her agency against the novel's intents and purposes. I want to further explore how Madame stands in for a number of complex, at times contradictory, imperial anxieties that the novel negotiates, particularly when it comes to the national economy. Madame's second marriage is to Mr. North, a partner of the North and Gas Works, a company of national symbolic importance, as is indicated in such tacit colonial allusions as you see here, but also in the company's incomparability throughout the kingdom. However, it is Madame's apparently insatiable desire that continuously drains the company of its funds. 
leaving it vulnerable to the vicious influence of trade unions. unions. The unions can thus prey on the already affected organism of the town's economical center, spreading a quote unquote poison that causes a quote infection prevailing amidst other bodies of men, end of quote. And we cannot fail to notice that elsewhere in the novel, quote, Madam was disliked in the household worse than poison, end of quote. So she's not only structural, structurally the reason for the Northward's dilapidated, weakened state, but semantically superordinate evil. Her more than poisonous influence prepares the ground for a here foreign infiltration, trade unions and things that happen to other and other people, so to speak. Um, so when the strike over the course of the next two volumes ruins the company, the allegedly obstinate workers have deserted into a state of feral underclassness and many are confined to the workhouse. But what is actually worse? The work, quote, the works would never be what they had been. For one thing, Richard had not capital and if he had, perhaps he might not have cared to embark it, end of quote. Given the national identification of the Northern Gas Works, the episode not only deprives the community of its means, but more importantly, breaks Britain's enterprising and inherently colonial spirit, encapsulating the sensational dangers of nomadic subjectivity to domestic and, as this novel makes very clear, colonial hegemonies. And to briefly conclude, and um, I, I'm really looking forward to discussing this in a few weeks' time with many of you, these are constructions of danger that we in different degrees and obviously with different racial politics find in Lady Armine and in Madaman, which I find generative. They allow us to see these novels unwilling understanding of transnationally honed femininity and its appendant nomadic subjectivity as disruptive and endowed with agency. And I'd go so far as to suggest that this is the linchpin of these novels sensationalism. In the very moments that a faithful woman and Bessie Rain show their sensational affinities and introduce their exoticized villainesses, they betray a profound unease about the domestic empire impact of empire itself, and a subtle awareness that the marginalizing, gendered and racializing discourses of and within the British Empire might not just be that effective after all. Thank you very much.